Hello and welcome to FACT's webinar called Thinning, Clearing, and Establishing Forest, Forage and Fodder. This is part two of a two-part series about converting woodland to silvopasture. Our presenter today is Steve Gabriel from Wellspring Forest Farm, and I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I'll be moderating the session. Thanks for joining us today. So before we dive right in, let me do a quick few introductions uh, about FACT in case you're not familiar with us. Um, we are a national nonprofit organization and we are headquartered in Illinois. And we work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, such as, as yourselves, uh, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and also by helping consumers make informed food choices. So my colleague, Samantha and I run FACT's Humane Farming Program, and we, we have the honor and pleasure of working with livestock and poultry farmers from all across the country. We offer grants, scholarships, personalized materials, mentorship, and of course, many webinars. Uh, so I invite you to please visit our website. You can find it us at foodanimalconcernstrust.org forward slash farmer to learn more about these opportunities and other farmer services. Oh, at this time, I'm really pleased, honored to introduce our acclaimed presenter, Steve Gabriel. Steve is an extension, excuse me, agroforestry extension specialist for the Cornell Small Farms Program. He's also written several books about silvopasture, and along with his family, Steve operates Wellspring Forest Farm and School in the Finger Lakes region of New York. So we're super lucky to have Steve with us today. He was with us last week um, to share all of his experience and expertise. So I think at this point, I am going to um, turn the floor over to you, Steve, so you may take it away. Alrighty, should see my slides. Great. Oh, let me just move stuff around for a minute. Great. Thanks for coming back <laughs> for more. Or if this is your first time, welcome and um, feel free to check out the other webinar we did. We decided to split this into two because there's just too much good stuff to cover um, when talking about woodland conversion to civil pasture. So I'll get into that a little bit and some of the details we're gonna pick up from sort of the assessment discussion we had last time and talk more about implementation and some strategies there. So feel free to pop questions in the Q&A. Um, that's the best place for us to keep track of them um, as we go here. And I have a lot of past webinars. I've been grateful to FACT for supporting me to do these. And um, those are available through the link on the screen there. They're also going to be posted at silvopasturebook.com along with an, a number of other recorded things. So if you want to dig in more to other topics, related topics, um, I encourage you to check those out. Silvopasturebook.com um, is the host page for the book. You can order a copy if you're interested directly from me. You can also check out a bunch of additional resources we have. Recently, we've been doing a lot of work with tree fodder. I'll touch on that a little bit today. And um, silvopasturebook.com is the website to find that stuff. If you go to the homepage of that website, you're going to find at the top a couple links for a couple surveys I'm hoping folks can help us complete. So if you fall into these categories, um, we're not excluding folks that aren't here. We're just doing geographical based work for grants and, and projects. So one is Northeast practitioners of livestock trees and uh, forage integration. Um, there's a survey to, to just share a little bit about that. And then if you're in New York in particular, we have a agroforestry awareness and, and adoption survey that we're still looking for responses for. So again, both links at the top of the silvopasturebook.com website. We'd love your participation if, if um, applicable. It's helping us with some of our education outreach and, and grant writing work um, to get a better sense of who's out there and who's doing the, doing the good work. <clears throat> Other thing I'll mention linked both at our farm website as well as the Silver Pasture Book website um, is a free online class that really dovetails nicely with the things we'll talk about today. Um, generally speaking around forest ecology and stewardship, something we uh, developed several years ago, um, but has some really good principles and practices to, to check out. And that's just a self-directed course um, that you can access through our, our online course platform. So do take advantage of that if you're interested. So Wellspring Forest Farm, um, we set the orientation of farming in the image of a forest. So for us, if we have 
landscape dominated by woody trees and shrubs and plants, we're going to manage that for long-term forest health. And where there isn't forest, namely open pasture, we're looking to reestablish and establish a forest that's both um, ecologically beneficial and as well as um, productive for, for the systems and, and management that we're, we're seeking on the landscape. Um, our farm does a number of things uh, in terms of production. Um, our main crops actually mushrooms that we grow both outside in an agroforestry system and indoor production. Pastured lamb would be where the civil pasture comes in. Um, we're doing dabbling some tree nursery work that we hope to expand over the coming years and we definitely do some education agritourism. If you're ever in the Finger Lakes area of New York, we have a couple of rentals to stay on farm and that's a nice way to see the area and visit the farm. Um, bigger context, longer term context, we are broadcasting today from unceded Gaiocono territory. Um, it's important and it's been important in our farm journey to reckon and recognize and understand the deeper meanings of this and to support and uplift the sovereignty of our Goyancono neighbors who are very much present in the area and um, have all the rights of a sovereign nation. And um, some of our work supports and is in connection and solidarity with them. And so just wanna acknowledge that as part of the context for our farm and our discussion. Um, wherever you are on, on land, it has an indigenous story and it's really useful to dig into that in my experience. Um, and, and important to do. So and another reason I bring that up is, as I mentioned last week, agroforestry is a new term for a very old set of practices and, and concepts and philosophy, really. Um, and I've been blessed to mentor with a forester locally who's part of the Seneca Nation, uh, Mike DeMunn, who's taught me a lot about the, the lenses, the glasses one needs to wear in order to uh, do good work on the landscape. And so some of the things I'll be sharing come directly from that lineage and, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. And um, much of the landscape um, that was managed pre-colonization, uh, pre-settlement really looked like an agroforestry landscape. It was a mixed mosaic of tree crops and, and, um, and management. And um, while there wasn't a lot of domesticated livestock, at least at the beginning, there were certainly livestock in the landscape, um, I guess, naturalized animals. Um, and the conditions that many indigenous communities maintained were akin to something we might call silva pasture. So just like to keep that in mind, those words are very new. They're only maybe used in the last 50 or 60 years, but certainly the practices on landscapes globally have a much longer history. And I mentioned this, in more detail, I'll just uh, briefly revisit the definition that uh, we like to use for silvopasture here, that it's ecological restoration for livestock habitat. And for us, that really just speaks to the two anchor points and reference points that we, we refer back to a lot to think about how different decisions on the farm um, both hit an ecological need and, and support the ultimate health and, and benefit of the livestock as well. And if they don't meet those two criteria, then they're not something that we, we pursue. So. Um, uh, in its most basic sense, any sort of system in integrating trees, livestock, um, and forages intentionally can be called civil pasture. Um, we're focused on the left side of the screen where we're talking about forest and woody dominated landscapes and the process of transitioning that to civil pasture. There's also a whole nother kind of segment of civil pasture which focuses on establishing trees and pasture. And um, if you want to dig into some of those things, the the webinars I mentioned previously definitely um, uh, get into a lot of those topics. So we'll, we're going to zoom in a little bit today and just focus on this aspect of things. And I want to just mention this is a picture from an undisclosed location somewhere in the world um, to say this is not silvopasture. pasture. This is the uh, aftermath of some pigs in a woodland. You can see exposed uh, flares on the trees and exposed roots, uh, decompacted soil. Um, this is certainly an area that was overgrazed and could potentially do long term damage to these trees. When we talk about civil pasture, we're talking about two really critical things. One is making sure there's enough food for the animals in the landscape so that they're not doing damage to the soil or the trees or the other plants. And also that there's adequate rest and recovery periods between livestock um, interaction to make sure that um, the landscape stays healthy. And unfortunately, too, too often we see these kind of scenarios showing up. And we wouldn't want to call these silver pasture um, because they're denuding the landscape over time. And um, the effects on these trees may not be seen for, for decades or generations um, because it sometimes takes a while for those impacts to, to show up. So we're going to talk about woodland conversion and kind of the process of getting in some of the, the nitty gritty details um, that we've experienced in our uh, efforts to do this over the last 10 years on this 
on this piece of land and uh, much longer on other uh, other places and other projects. But we can really start with the idea that um, one one phrase I've heard um, from folks is uh, woodland conversion is um, silver pasture by subtraction, uh, which means we are removing vegetation, specifically re removing vegetation enough so that enough light gets through the canopy of the forest and hits the, the soil itself so that forages can be uh, cultivated and sustained. And so um, part of this is, is about the skillful and strategic removal of this material in a way that actually benefits the forest while also creating those conditions. And a lot of folks I want to kind of throw out at the beginning here, a lot of say, people say, well, this is great because I can thin for civil pasture and maybe sell a bunch of wood and make, make money doing this. And in my experience, um, you might be able to find in the right scale, the right species composition, the right market, uh, a timber sale that or, or other kind of wood product sale that might offset some of the costs. But chances are you're going to need those loggers to do a little more work than they're interested in. Um, one example is thinning much smaller diameter trees in order to, again, get more light to the understory. And um, in that case, you know, often if, if at best a sale of a product from that job pays maybe for some of that work, you're also gonna have to establish forage and do this. So, um, so the offset of a, a timber harvest does not usually equate to, you know, making money doing this. Maybe it'll offset some or all of that cost. There are also programs depending on where you are tuning in from that can help cost share or support civil pasture activities. Um, code 381 is the civil pasture standard that the USDA has listed. Um, some states acknowledge it, some do not, like New York State is not currently um, listing this as one of its uh, practices that it approves. But there are other mechanisms and often NRCS funding is a really good strategy if you have a, a helpful local support person working for the agency, you can figure out ways to align civil pasture goals with other funding programs. Um, but by and large, this is something that we have to think about in the context of larger land goals um, and sometimes out of pocket in order to make it work. So it's got to make sense in the context of a good livestock enterprise um, as we go. So here's a civil pasture conversion. This is uh, Angus Glen Farm um, just up the road from us here in central New York, and they run um, several hundred head of, of Angus cattle. Um, our operation is focused on sheep, so I like to provide examples from multiple scales. And you can see some of the um, effects of this more, this is a recent photo taken the season after that conversion. And I like to show this photo because there's a couple key things to keep in mind. One of them is that we're not looking for a, a uniform uh, spacing of trees in the landscape. Both the good forestry practices um, don't usually result in that. And also we don't wanna create an environment that's homogenous, that's, um, that's the same everywhere. And so you can see in this photo, we have patches where understory vegetation or suppressed or slower growing trees are still present. And you also have gaps in the canopy sufficient enough to get light in and establish forage. Also to note is that the, the material is left behind from some of the thinning work. So we're not extracting everything and creating a green astroturf like setting. We want to actually have this material sometimes called coarse woody debris scattered throughout the site. We don't want to block um, access or make it dangerous for animals, but we find that um, this is a really important factor in long-term soil health in the forest. The forest that requ requires and demands this debris in order to be healthy. And so we want to keep that in, in the spirit of a civil pasture type system. And it has some other unseen benefits too, which I'll, I'll expand upon in a, in a minute. Third thing I want to mention from this photo is that this, the forage you can see established in here is not necessarily as lush uh, or as immediate as you might find in a, in a really abundant pasture at this time of year. This was in uh, early summer. And that's because it takes a while to get this forage established. And one of the critical decision points you're going to have to make is once you do some of the disturbance in order to create silver pasture, are you going to kind of work with what shows up in the seed bank of the soil? Or are you going to add in um, <clears throat> seed and, and other materials in order to encourage certain forages to grow? And that's a really important decision point when we're engaged with this type of, this type of work. I talked a lot last week, and I'll just mention this kind of good orienting principle in forestry, thinning is mother nature with thin. So rather than imposing ideas of who should stay and who should go in a forest management plan, really looking to mother nature for clues of who is thriving and who is struggling and how those can inform the decisions of how we steer the next succession of the forest. So this tree here you can see in the photo has some evidence of dieback on the crown. And this can be really useful to observe in your woods and start to make note of which trees 
either from um, slow growth or uh, shading or disease or uh, pests or just aging out uh, might be showing some of that dieback. And that can be indicators this tree is on the descent of its life and um, should be honored as such, but might be a good candidate for thinning or some other kind of establishment strategy. So we look for those clues, we gather evidence before we go and do our prescriptions in the forest. And we're really lending um, this to just moving things along in the same way that they're already progressing um, as in sort of a natural state, whatever that means. <laughs> and in that vein, you know, I mentioned not clearing every square inch and, and keeping everything uniform. We've really seen our and learned a lot from our animals and how this really plays out. And um, this is an area that we've converted to silo pasture that uh, initially we thought, well, we really need to just get all this scrubby brush out and clean it up in a sense. And there's a tendency to sometimes want to do that. But we had a freak winter storm in early January. This is many, many years ago now. Um, and this was, we were not expecting lambs at this time of year, but um, if lambs come early, they seem to show up when the storms do. And so this was uh, a ewe that gave birth three or four months early. Um, somebody had snuck in. <laughs> previous year, I guess. And um, we couldn't find her. We finally found her tucked away in this brushy uh, material pile here that um, formed a really powerful shelter for her to have a really healthy birth. And it made us realize that this sort of uniform open silver pasture that we see in a lot of pictures is not what we want to do 100% of the, the time. And we want to make sure there's sheltered space. That's one of the real benefits of silver pastures, creating environments that shelter our animals from the snow and the wind and the rain and, and the other factors. Um, and so just she, we take a cue from, from them a lot when we think about how to, how to work these things. And similarly, this is a video I took a screenshot from of one of our ewes um, enjoying the benefits of a, a wild grapevine in the silver pasture, which uh, we were planning to cut all that stuff out because it can tangle up trees and, and become a nuisance, but um, she was finding it to be an excellent scratching post. Uh, so, you know, just keep these things in mind and recognize that your perception of the forest isn't the same as the livestock and things that you may not see value in, um, they might show you otherwise. And it's really affected the way that we think about um, what we leave and, and how we change things over time. So if we're uh, focused on a silver pasture area, um, one thing we talked about last week was uh, incorporating stand mapping and really isolating different parts of the forest that have different species composition, different water hydrology or topographical characteristics and that want to be managed in, in a similar way. And uh, in forestry, that's usually called stand mapping where we, we isolate out of the forest it, uh, individual stands. And so it's what's really good to start with is a manageable stand that you want to convert to a civil pasture. This is an example of one of our first ones where we just bit off about two acres. It was adjacent to some of the fields we were grazing. It was adjacent to a wetland that we have no intention of grazing. That's more of a conservation area, but it was a really unproductive space that we could see the benefits um, for our grazing system as well as for the um, ecology in doing the civil pasture transition. So a key part of this is to you know, start an area, start with an area that's small enough that you can visit it consistently and visit it often and walk through it. One of our first goals with this space was actually just to make some paths through because we it was so overgrown with so much brush that we didn't even know what was going on inside. So we made some ways and, and made an intention to, to visit it often and really do a lot of deep observation. And that's a really important factor in this because you're gonna make small incremental changes and then you're gonna see how the system responds. Another factor when you're selecting an area is to think about a uh, marginal area. So we're not, I, I mentioned extensively last time, we're not going to look to our maturing or our older forests for silvopasture, pasture, at least not until we have a lot more experience knowing what we're doing. Um, we're going to focus on areas that are marginal in the landscape that don't appear to have um, sort of a traditional forest health, uh, older trees, um, those kind of systems we want to leave be and, and appreciate them as a as a healthy intact forest. So I'm sure on most farmland we find these marginal, if not all, most of the land that we have is sort of in between. It's a recently abandoned farmland. Um, there's a lot of uh, trees trying to sort of sort out what's going on there and it's ripe for silver pasture. But we want to focus on those areas first and it also gives us a degree of flexibility as we learn um, through the process. So we look at the site, we choose that area, we assess those qualities. I talked uh, about that last week more in detail. Um, some of the main things that, that show up as really affecting how a site can evolve would be water, soils, the slope or aspect, the direction that slope is facing, existing vegetation and microclimate. 
Um, and these can really inform what species are going to do well there. Potentially, if there's any water uh, mediation that we need to do or any soil remediation, if we're deficient in something or the pH is out of balance, those are things that are good to know early on so we can incorporate those into our transition plan. And I'll mention with soils, there's a difference between what you can find in sort of the National Soil Survey versus what you can do on site. So often the National Soil Survey will list uh, sort of a broad swath of soil characteristics, but it won't give you the nutrient um, levels or the, or the pH or the organic matter. Um, or it might do that generally, but it won't do it to a specificity that you need to actually make management decisions. So you can use the National Survey as a way to get a good sense of things, but you really need to do on-site testing prior to starting to get a real sense of the snapshot of what's happening in more recent time. And then you really need to reflect on what goals you have for silver pasture. And what's important, and if I've worked with a lot of folks on different projects and those that have well clear articulated goals and reasons for doing the extra work and investing the energy and resources you need to do this, have a really good outcome. If you're sort of like, I'm not sure, I just think it's kind of cool, it's harder to steer, steer the boat into the right place um, and figure out what that looks like. So for us, one of the main reasons and what we see with a lot of practitioners of silver pasture is they wanna um, utilize land that is not currently in a part of their grazing system. They see the benefits of increasing the utilization of their landscape as a whole. Also, often these woody, especially the overgrown kind of woody areas offer shade and shelter where our open pastures often offer the opposite. So there's a real opportunity there that many people recognize. And this is really where we started um, our civil pasture and where we continue to put a lot of our effort is those edges this actually represents about 20% of the total land that we both uh, have title to, but we also um, rent some of it. And so, um, and, and in these edges, you can see ring a lot of the main pastures that we use for grazing. So they're ripe opportunities to incorporate them into our grazing system without a lot of extra effort. So for us, a drought in 2016 was really where we started because we didn't have active pasture doing very well. And we kind of stuck the animals in the in the hedgerows that at that point were so overgrown we didn't really know what was happening in there and had them start to start to nip away and found that our katahdin sheep in particular were really well suited to this and and did quite well this was about a 45 day window where we didn't have good pasture growing and so we rested the pastures and we got them in here and they really uh, enjoyed themselves and seemed to uh, not only benefit from the, the, the diverse diet available in this hedgerow, but also the shade and shelter because that drought was coupled with a, a pretty hot summer as well. And it really let, set off some light bulbs. We said, well, this is great, but if we don't manage this for the long term, we're not going to just be able to kind of borrow from, you know, the past uh, uh, sort of the past farmer who ignored this and just let it kind of grow up, right? We need to think about how to manage this long term. So for us, one of our major goals is vegetation management and a, a theme on a farm, especially a perennial, um, you know, pasture based agroforestry farm is always like, how am I going to manage all this vegetation? And <laughs> at the beginning, that can be, wow, this stuff's been growing sort of unchecked for decades. How am I going to work with that? And then after you start to kind of nick away at that, then how am I going to manage it to sustain or, or maintain the types of diverse forages that I want? And again, we take a lot of lessons and direction from the animals and what they like to do and what they see as beneficial. So here's one of our sheep um, munching on honeysuckle, uh, which often listed as an invasive species. Um, it's certainly persistent in many of our landscapes and turns out has a really high feed value. And I'll share a little bit about that at the end here. But um, our main goal with getting them interacting with it was to knock back some of those large shrubs and, and keep them under check as we think about diversifying forage. We already see, and anyone that works with livestock knows that on a hot day, you'll find your animals finding the closest shade if, if available and, and spending their time. And especially ruminants, um, goats and sheep and, and cattle are going to seek that out during their, their rumination period um, and then go back out to pasture to graze. And so that's great. And these hedgerows offered that to us before we really converted them to silver pasture. But you can see an issue here where long term we have bare soil, which usually means the susceptibility for things like erosion and compaction and, um, and things like that. And um, you can see an overgrown canopy that basically doesn't let any light in, right? So again, these hedgerows become some of the easiest places to work with the, the livestock and to open up. So one of our first strategies was to open up the edges and, and make sure there was light getting through. This hedgerow uh, in the pictures here is roughly 100 feet long and um, maybe 50 feet wide or so. So it's a little too wide. 
and there's a lot of thick vegetation on the edges so there was not sunlight penetrating through so very carefully we start to manage and thin and some of that stuff we're removing altogether some of it we're we're pollinating or coppicing to encourage re-sprout to provide a food source for our animals but you can see we're starting to see this is that same tree from the first photo where we have bare bare ground the tree is on, on the left there um, to something that starts to get established now we not only did the thinning but we also did some frost seeding in here you can see some clover at the bottom of the slide and we, we paired that with some bale grazing so these are strategies where we leverage the innate abilities of the animal to create the conditions to get good seed to soil contact and get this stuff established. And then over time we added in grasses and we continue to do this and now you can see the, the same tree there in the middle um, that originally had bare uh, soil all around it. This, this picture is a bit misleading in that it's spring so there's a lot of light getting in because the trees haven't started really leafing out yet. But you get a sense of what we're talking about going from that conversion of bare soil into these silvopasture pasture type edges. And you can see just beyond where we didn't thin enough there's no forage established. So light really is the limiting factor for a lot of our, our climate systems. Same hedgerow, a little bit further down, another strategy we utilized to, to shift and, and work with the sort of persistent vegetation on the edge was to bale graze here in the winter. And what we find is when we bale graze, we give the, the sheep that, that bale and they're done in an hour and they're bored. What are they gonna do with the rest of their day? And so we found that it was very good for them to, to take to this honeysuckle in this case and basically strip all the bark. And by the next season, we could pretty much knock this stuff over with the tractor um, as a really good way to suppress and work this down. And then inevitably the honeysuckle would sprout from the roots, but then that was accessible for browsing um, anytime those sheep came through. Um, and this is what it looked like in a few years. So we really transitioned it just by getting the animals in the right place at the right time and getting them out before they mucked it up too much or caused, caused any trouble. And so now these hedgerows and these edges have become really valuable transition zones between the open pasture um, that we have on, on either side. So your transition can be slow. It can, it can be a bit of a hand tool type work when you have a few extra minutes. We've done this all over the farm, um, keeping loppers with the tractor, with the solar, you know, the solar panel kit or just on us has, has proven really helpful. And it, it, it's, there's something different about clearing vegetation when you're feeding it to your livestock because um, it feels like you're harvesting versus eradicating something or removing something. And I found that to be really beneficial and um, always take some time when I have, you know, that extra 10 or 15 minutes to do some of this work and so slowly this is a, a, a me and some of the farm interns um, this was several years ago now freeing up this beautiful big willow tree that's in there and now we've coppiced that back and actually the sheep can access a lot of that browse but it was completely overgrown and there wasn't any easy way to go in there but kind of nip at it over time and so anytime the sheep were in the vicinity we would take advantage of that Another area, another hedgerow, you know, too dense, far, far too dense for any sort of meaningful grazing. This is an overstory mostly of European buckthorn, another common sort of persistent um, plant that also has some good fodder value. And so we've opened this up and, and again, put the sheep in here during hot times of the year. And then that's when we go in with, uh, with uh, some of the tools to remove some of this and give them access to it so they can help with some of the clearing work. And I'm really excited, honestly, about the sort of emergence of battery operated chainsaws because um, prior to this, I felt always nervous using a gas powered chainsaw because a lot of this is kind of overhead or work and in, in kind of thick spaces and um, chainsaw was a bit too heavy and, and, and awkward, but an electric chainsaw can do really good work in here uh, really quickly. Um, so I recommend that. So in addition to thinking about your goals and how those can be an orienting feature, again, kind of vegetation management is our orienting feature. And so we, we think about how that plays out in different scenarios and different opportune times. So for instance, this year, we didn't do a lot of this because um, it was an incredibly wet year. We had a lot of grass and we were just working hard just to keep up with the pasture. Um, but in 2020, it was super dry and we didn't have a lot of pasture resource. And so the animals spent a lot more time in the woods and we did a bit more of that, that thinning work that I showed you. But what's really key among, amongst all is to make sure that before you're putting your animals in these woody landscapes and having them interact is that you, you get access to those. Um, and I mentioned already, good for you to walk through them and really get to know them. And You'll probably find some surprises along the way you know we've, we've uncovered some really cool old like apple trees that um, make really good cider apples that our friend who does cider gets really excited about and we found some random white birches that really aren't common in this climate but pop up somehow here and there in our woods I mean just some fun discoveries as we're walking through and checking things out and what I like to do when I'm doing those walks is, is have a roll of that forestry flagging tape and anytime I find something that is unique or that I want to keep, I, I flag it because 
inevitably sometime we're going to come through there with uh, maybe a chainsaw, maybe a piece of machinery. Maybe I'm going to hire a contractor to do that. And I want to make sure they're aware that this is a keeper. And I don't want them to mow it over. And someone, including myself, if I'm too excited and I'm in a big skid steer or something, I may not notice those things without really good flagging. So that could be a good way to interact and kind of build the portfolio of the woods and sort of make some of those decisions just as you're taking a nice, you know, morning or evening stroll. Um, and just look for patterns of vegetation. So forests, you know, if you find a unique plant, that plant is a parent, their parent is somewhere, may not be on site, may not be close by, but they're somewhere. Um, ask questions about what's showing up there and why, and why something's thriving and why something may not be thriving. And that can be different types of species. Um, it can also be within a species. And just constantly asking yourself those questions. Um, for fencing, this is the biggest thing for access. When you're bringing animals in, you gotta you gotta get the fencing in there. And um, I am I'm a pretty big fan of the portable net fencing. Um, once you get over the learning curve and know how to use it properly, it's not a pain in the butt. But in a woodland setting, it can it can be particularly annoying because if you're dragging that along the floor, any little stump or stick or twig or anything will snag it, bind it up, make it make a mess of it. So. Learning how to roll it up and carry it or uh, avoid that is really good. But also I've learned over time that your alleys where you're gonna have your fencing temporarily really need to be wide enough. And when we started, we thought a foot or two was wide enough, you know, just wide enough to kind of shove our way in. And we've since learned that, you know, what's wide enough is whatever the width of the brush hog is <laughs> so that we can drive the tractor through and have a really nice clean alley. And now we do that and um, what's in the fence line is grass. And so we can just do a quick pass with the mower, set up the fence and we're good to go. So here's some fencing through that uh, initial map I showed you, the silver pasture there. Um, you can see a little narrow. We started to widen this out and make it a little easier on ourselves. Um, portable fencing long term may not be something you want to deal with, but it, it, when you're initially starting, it can be really helpful. And one of the reasons is you may not know where those finished fence lines are going to be. And once you put those posts in the ground, you're not going to move them. So this gives you some time to play and experiment. We've, we've changed our paddock configurations um, almost every year. We've been grazing here for nine years and um, yeah, they change a lot. So give yourself that flexibility, especially if it's early on. Um, yeah, another picture of moving fence, very easy in the field <laughs> to learn how to do it. Practice out here and then, and then take that knowledge into the woods. We've uh, since migrated over time to make our, our fencing a little more efficient. We do perimeters with the net fencing and then we subdivide with strand fencing and that's on the reels, um, which can go really quick. We just kind of zigzag back and forth. So we'll do a strand, we'll go back and we'll do a strand and we'll do our three and then they're subdivided. And we know if the sheep get out of those strands, because sometimes we have a pesky ram lamb or someone that doesn't want to follow the rules. Um, they're still in that perimeter of net fencing. And that's that works for us in terms of being worried about them getting out or, or predation. We have pretty low predation concerns, but um, that's really saved us a lot of time and energy and, and dollars in terms of setting up a perimeter that's usually encompassing like three or four paddocks and then subdividing with the strand. And I've seen some sheep farmers get away with as, as few as two strands. Um, what I miss about managing cattle is you can usually get away with one strand and that really saves a lot of time too. So um, you cannot get away with this probably with goats or pigs, just so you know, you, you need you need pretty much uh, <laughs> as solid a barrier as you can get away with or something that's very, very hot in order to do this. Another strategy that we've utilized on our farm landscape that's worked really well is a strategy to use the trees themselves as, um, as a fence post, <coughs> excuse me. And um, we're borrowing this idea from Brett Chedzoy, who's the um, neighbor I mentioned, who has the Angus farm that um, we work on civil pasture things together through Cornell. Um, so he learned this from yet another farmer, uh, a strategy for attaching fencing in a way that would not <laughs> suck the fencing or the, or the piece of wood into the tree over the long term. So if you notice zoomed in there, we have, a fender washer that is um, in between the nail and the board. And what that does is it, it prevents the tree from sucking the nail in as it grows. And so as the tree grows, it'll actually push the board out more and more, therefore saving the tree. Now we don't want to use our best quality trees for this purpose, but this can be a really good solution for those low, low grade trees, the suppressed trees in the forest. We do this on, uh, we have a small like four acre pine plantation and what's nice is the trees are all planted in a row so we could just do our fencing and we fence this type of system for our winter paddocks for the sheep and um, yeah we were able to get away with I think only buying like 10 locust posts otherwise it was all trees and a, a couple pieces of rebar as well 
So a really effective way. Um, other tricks of the trade, um, this, this I took actually from our maple sugaring photos. Um, simply using tensile fence, you can use all that stuff and, and just wrap it around the tree with a piece of um, tubing. And I'd really recommend using old maple tubing versus um, what you buy from fence suppliers for, for the wraparounds because it's, it's fractions of the cost um, to do that. So um, just different ways to, to work with the trees just keep in mind to still protect them, right? Because I'm sure we've all seen on many farm landscapes the, the wire in the middle of the tree, and that will happen over time. <coughs> so figuring out ways to do that can be really important. You can see here that we make sure that this is attached to the tree, but not so tight that it doesn't have room to, room to grow. And then another example of fencing that we're starting to play with a lot more, especially as we talk about tree establishment on our farm, is what's called a 3D fence. Um, these are often used by hunters to establish deer plots, um, at least around us. And um, a 3D fence is really an economical way to both potentially provide a livestock solution, depending on your livestock, um, but also to fence trees out from, from uh, herbivory browse like deer. Um, and the way it works is you have two fences about a meter apart. Um, you can see the back fence has a, a, a line at about two feet and four feet, and then there's an interior fence that is, is splitting the difference in those two. And, and the gap between those and the fact that it's electrified, that's very important, prevents the animals from wanting to jump over. It's important that it's electrified very well. It's also important that sometimes that you bait it and actually train the deer to know it's there, but uh, a very effective and cost, uh, cost effective way as well to potentially fence things out. And I just threw, threw a couple fun fencing things. And this is from a video series I really recommend folks check out. It's called Woodlanders. A lot of cool old, sort of ways that folks have interacted and worked with the woods. I just love this. This is a Swedish fencing style that uses suppressed um, spruce saplings in the forest there to build these fences. And what I think is so cool is the suppressed trees, which from a wood quality standpoint, you know, we don't want suppressed slow growing trees, but from a fencing standpoint is great because those tight rings that are slow growing slow down the, the um, um, decomposition of these fences. And so really simple fencing system and they're actually bound with the boughs of the spruce so there's a tying method to do that and you can go on woodlanders it's either .org or .com and watch the video it's really cool just to see and you know think about these different methods where we might have the resources around us to build them and from watching the video i'm, I'm convinced this isn't a, a a fence that would take forever to do we've done a couple experiments with hedge lane at our farm this is a living fence built out of willow um, we have maybe 100 feet of this, not, not enough to cover our grazing plan, but it's worked really well. We grew these willow from live stakes um, for about six years, and then we cut it down in such a way that we could weave it into these, these stakes that we're pounding in here, you can see. And then that now resprouts and regrows and becomes a living fence. And if you know anything about tree fodder, willow is a great fodder for grazing animals. So now we have this fence that's also a feed bar. Um, and it's worked really well. It's kind of felt like it's been experimental, but we're definitely thinking about ways to expand it on the farm. And the old trick of hedge lane is that you cut the, you do what's called cleaving a bleacher. And so you're cutting these sprouts um, in such a way that you can, you can see you're just cutting enough of that so that it'll bend over without snapping off of the base. And that allows for the sap flow to still happen and for the, the tree to be bent into shape, but still be woven into the system. Um, it's worked great. And you can see here, the, the, this was probably last year we took this picture um, where you can see the re-sprout of that willow that we originally uh, managed and uh, just in a couple of years. And what's cool about this is the re-sprout is actually much more palatable for the animals. So just to throw some ideas out there, you know, we're going to probably rely on the, the net fencing and the, the high tensile and all that for a while, but long term, it would be great if we all had a, some of these more natural methods and um, they take a little skill and a little time. We might have the resources right on site, um, might save us some money in the long run. All right, so when converting to silvopasture in the woodland, I've talked about access and, and sort of all those pieces. Another question to really think about is, you know, how soon do I need this to be silvopasture? Um, and a balancing point is, is with your management goals and what you're after, but also we don't want to generally clear out um, forests too much too fast, especially forests that are well stocked with a lot of standing trees. And that's because we can create undesirable consequences because you have a system where the trees have all grown up together. And if you open it up too much, you can get things called sun scald where too much light can have damage to the trees or epicormic branching or wind throw. If the winds are intense on your site, it could have a negative effect if the trees aren't able to sort of um, 
acclimatize to the change in density that you've created. So that's a piece to consider. Um, but then, you know, how much do I need this for my productive livestock enterprise? How quickly do I need to move this? And so we kind of think about different spots on the land as having different intensities that we're managing. Some will clear really quickly. Some will just kind of nip away. Like I mentioned, the, the loppers would be the slowest way to go about it. So we've done a lot of management with a, you know, a, a gas powered um, brush cutter, which is basically like a circular, say, uh, <coughs> circular saw blade on a weed whacker. And that can be really useful, especially in hard to reach areas with other things. Um, chainsaw work, we've talked about that. And um, forestry mulchers is a couple examples here. What I like about the forestry mulcher, and this is on our farm a few years ago, um, we can rent this locally. Um, if you're familiar with safe operation of a, of a skid steer, it's basically like a brush hog on the top. And so you can lift it up and just sort of like chew things to the ground. What's really nice about this is you're actually mulching all that material. One of the issues of thinning slower is you have piles of brush usually, and you have to figure out what to do with them or how to organize them again so that they have some benefit to the soil, but they're also not in your way or, or creating um, a blockage for the forage you're trying to establish. So I really like this because it kind of mulches things as you go. This is not on our farm, but it's a good example of post harvest here. Now this silver patch, you still might want to uh, cut out a few of these smaller diameter trees to get a little more light in there, but you get the idea. It makes a nice seed bed. And again, I mentioned this is a really critical point. What am I going to do at this moment? Am I going to rely on what's already on site as far as the vegetation that's going to show up? Because it will. Or am I going to add in something? And I've always been of the approach of less is more. <laughs> um, I've seen silver pastures where they're almost like tilling it up and and seeding it like you would a field. Um, not a huge fan of that if we don't need to, because you're disturbing the fungal presence, especially, but a lot of microbial um, activity that's happening in the soil is going to be disturbed and it'll come back, but why do it if you have to? And, and also try to um, really limit our disturbance to the things that, that, don't, that only feel necessary. Uh, and so we found other ways to establish good forage without, without having to go that route. Um, this is that same, same site, kind of different angle. Um, they did do some, some broadcast seeding, which I'll talk about a little bit. And um, uh, this is the next growing season. So pretty quick uh, recovery and a little bit overdone. They should have grazed it a little sooner because there's a lot of seed heads in there. Uh, another example of a place that uh, has become really valuable in our silver pasture for our livestock is what we would call um, a living barn, which um, again, I sort of borrowed from multiple people, but Brett is definitely the one who introduced me to this concept of an outdoor space that is shade and shelter for animals, especially during inclement weather or, or the winter months. So we have some pine plantation on our, on our farm and um, it's ecologically speaking, not super good for wildlife. Um, usually these pine plantations, as they get into the 50, 60, 70 year range, you start to see a lot of trees that uh, aren't so strong and in for the long haul uh, break off and fall in and you get kind of a messy understory. Um, you could certainly open this up and try to cultivate forage. But for us, what we really needed when we thought about our goals was a place to have the animals overwinter well, um, that was well sheltered and, and dry. Um, a lot of our land is really wet seasonally. And so we have a high dry plantation that they uh, chose very well for this plantation. So we've gone through the process of doing that thinning and determining, uh, as I mentioned in the last webinar, who the crop trees are, which are the, <clears throat> the this is a, not a photo from that because <laughs> it's a, this is a maple woods, but you get the idea. Um, paying attention to, you know, what trees are thriving. Again, we know that plantation all was planted at the same age. And so we see the trees that are doing really well. And we look for the ones that are in the canopy and, and likely to, to stay there for the long term. And then we thin a lot of the other ones that are more suppressed, smaller diameter um, in the understory. And we try to balance that um, with thinking about other, other ecological objectives. So chainsaws can be great. A, a quick caveat is to really know what you're doing with a chainsaw. It's one of the more dangerous tools because when you're on a machine, you have a certain level of protection, but you're holding a chainsaw, you're holding this uh, device that you have a chain whipping around at 60 miles an hour. And we've just seen a lot of folks get into trouble with that. And so make sure you train yourself on proper technique and also wear the safety gear if you're gonna do the chainsaw work yourself. 
Um, so we nip away at that kind of stuff over time. We get the animals in there. Uh, we think a lot about access. That's the biggest thing we've learned is really thinking carefully about what kind of things like we put our brown bales and our small bales in here for winter grazing. For the bale grazing, we need to get shelters in there. We have the porta hut metal shelters to stick in there. We have water, you know, so really thinking about our gate placement and how we're going to um, manipulate this forest, not just to make sure there's enough light and that we're getting those objectives, but also that we can move easily is, is a trick, um, something we're still working with. So thinking about how to keep those systems flexible early on is really good. But it's proven for us to be a really valuable space. We have about eight paddocks in there and, it, and they're subdivided. Again, we have that perimeter fence with the high tensile with those tree uh, posts I showed you. The interior fence is more just like rebar. It's a really, you know, pretty basic stuff that if the sheep really wanted to, they could probably knock down, but they don't really seem to, to care. So that's kind of our internal fencing is a little less fortified than the external fencing, because then we know they're never going to get out too far. And um, by having multiple paddocks, we can kind of time it with the latest snowstorm or when things get a little mucky and the manure starts to build up and we can move them around. And what we'll do is we'll stash our large bales in here during the fall. And so we don't have to worry about that in the winter. We just have them ready wrapped uh, for them. And then we go in there and unwrap them during the, during the grazing uh, months in the winter. Oh, this slipped in here. Well, this, <laughs> this is another example of proper technique of, of forest uh, thinning. Um, I just want to mention the game of logging, which is a really great training to take in chainsaw safety. It teaches you this bore cut, which is a really safe way to fell a tree in any direction that you need to. Um, and I grew up learning the sort of back hinge, just kind of chase it with your saw and cross your fingers, hope it works. But this bore cut, what it does is it removes the interior of the wood. It creates a hinge, it creates that strap on the back and it allows you to insert wedges and be able to fell the tree really safely. Um, so do learn good technique so you can have that opportunity um, if you go. So finally, um, I like to think of forage establishment and fodder establishment as disturbance events. My background is really in ecology. And when we talk about a disturbance, it can sound like a negative thing, but disturbance really just means um, something came in and had a force on the landscape and the landscape responds to that force. And, you know, if we're going to do silver pasture and woodlots, the thinning is the first thing, getting that light in there is the first thing, opening things up for access and all the materials. But then we really have to think about the forage itself. And again, are we going to sort of let, let, let grow what grows, what is there, or are we going to try to uh, insert some of the des more desirable forages? And a particular uh, context to pay attention is where you have um, persistent sort of noxious plants that you don't want. You're definitely going to want to follow up your clearing with um, additional disturbance because otherwise those plants are going to have all this new light and be able to move into that space, which is often how those really shrubby, thick, prickly areas on the farm developed anyway. Someone opened up the light and then left it and the plants grew up. So there's a lot of different options um, on the menu. We really find that just timing is the most critical thing. So timing of impact followed with Seeding followed with mulching has been really effective in all sorts of different scenarios around the farm. And I'll just share a couple examples. And then also the disturbance of woody plants to think about how they can regrow so we can utilize them instead of just always wanting to boot them off, like eradicate them. So I'll show a couple examples there. Um, but, you know, one, one, this picture here, I couldn't actually find the picture. I had a nice picture of our sheep in one of those hedgerows, could not find it where, you know, it gets a little like kind of frozen and muddy in like November and they're trampling. And if we get them to do a little bit of that, but then move them before they overdo it, you create the really nice seed bed. And we've done this multiple times. If we time it right, then we just have to broadcast in there and mulch and, and we get beautiful establishment. So timing is really critical. If we're going to rent a machine and it's going to do that disturbance, well, let's follow it up with that seeding because you can benefit from that. And if you don't do it, you might actually have some negative effects, especially if there's heavy rain. So I found this picture in my preparation that I thought was just kind of funny because we have, um, this is a research project that was looking at the impact of trampling from, uh, I think this was in, yeah, yak and <laughs> Tibetan sheep. But I thought it was kind of funny because these are shoes that they created to mimic the, <laughs> the animals, but it, it kind of illustrates the point of um, that trampling effect can be one of these disturbances that can have a really uh, good impact. And, um, yeah, if you can time it well, it can it can be great. Um, 
Our team at Cornell is doing a lot of work with tarping, mostly in annual cropping systems like vegetables and things. But we have used tarping as a method to kill uh, undesirable vegetation. Usually what it takes is essentially matting something thick down that's going to block sunlight for upwards of a whole season. So sometimes doing this in the spring for the following year is, is the most effective. But it's been shown in these vegetable beds, which are really high, high weedy zones, to be very effective and um, a very cost-effective way of doing it. So if you knew ahead of time there was a place that you wanted to establish silva pasture, you didn't want to do, didn't have, or didn't want to do the machinery, blah, 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 the animal impact, okay, do some tarping and get that, that seed bed going. Frost seeding and overseeding um, at good strategic times has always been a strategy for us. We always try to have good cover crops on hand um, in mixes that we can add in to any site that we see having an opportune time. And if you don't have the seed, you can't usually capture that um, timing. So this is from uh, University of Wisconsin Extension. It's a pretty good sort of summary chart. Um, the important things to note here are the clovers, alfalfa to some degree, birds for trefoil, the, the, the legumes do really well with frost seeding. Part of that's because you have the hard seed coat, which allows it to handle um, that late winter time. So what we're looking for with frost seeding is when the thaw is starting to happen, or even a bit before that, we're seeding things down so that the action of the freeze and thaw gets that seed to soil contact going. If you have very thick vegetation prior to that, it doesn't matter. You still need to have exposed soil and a good seed bed, but it can help kind of work it in and, and there tends to be better germination. Some of these grasses will also do okay, but the key thing to keep in there is you can't do them too early because they can't handle um, getting hit by frost or something like that. So that's something to consider. And then there's some that are just not recommended um, for, for this kind of attempt. But um, we'll use Timothy uh, in our and in, in the fescues and the orchard grasses in our kind of perennial shade tolerant mix that we get from the local supplier. Again, it's on hand and anytime, um, even just seeing a bare patch, if we have it around, we could just throw it down and off and we can get some good establishment. So here's an example of timing and sort of sequencing of this type of thing. This is a site at the top of our farm. We did a building project. We built a a rental cabin for uh, one of our Airbnb rentals. And so that requires site prep and then the, you know, the septic and blah, 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 all this stuff. So lots of site disturbance, right? And so we wanted to follow that up with the with forage establishment. And we had pre previously done with that uh, forestry mulcher a really good job of opening this up. This was mostly overgrown, um, you know, honeysuckle and uh, multifloros and things. And we wanted to make an open, this is like an open glade. This is more like a savanna type space. This is not what we want on every part of the farm, but it's certainly appropriate for this area. So we did that. So that's that disturbance from the bulldozer, from the contractor, plus put the York rake on the tractor and just kind of did a little, you know, did some figure eights and just kind of loosened up the soil very soon after. Plus, talked to my farmer friend up the road who had some some kind of old, not so good <laughs> round bales, um, nothing that he was just looking to get rid of them. And I was looking for something that the sheep were interested enough in, but not trying to eat everything of because I want the mulch. So our sheep love to just like they'll, they, they, they're not that picky. They'll spend the whole day looking for, you know, something halfway decent in this bale, even if it's not that great. So we got those dropped off, rolled out to where we wanted them. And then the sheep went to work. And so what we did is basically just let them have it. And, you know, you end up with this big, big mound right around the thing. And then it spreads out from there. They, they, they do okay, but you have to go back through and, and still do a bit of spreading. But we did that, me and the farm employee by hand. It took us an hour throughout this whole, this is like a four acre site. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that bad, but we did a little spreading out. And, but by the way, before this, we did seed. So we seeded winter rye, because this is fall. And we did um, two types of clover and seeded that underneath. And then we made sure this mulch was very well established. It was early enough in the fall that the winter rye came up, which is what's key. Then it can hang out all winter. It, it won't grow, but it's not gonna die. It just hang out, hung out till spring. The clovers just um, started to sprout as well a little bit. And then they were all ready to just take off in the spring. And we had glorious pasture um, pretty quick from that. And of course, added input of, of fertility. <laughs> Um, so it was a really nice system and um, where the timing all kind of worked out well, it wasn't too rainy. I mean, there's a lot of factors that were out of our control too, but did establish several acres of good civil pasture. What's key to keep in mind though, is we did not graze this immediately the following year. We let it grow up for a whole season. We let that winter rye go to seed. We added, we broadcast more stuff in because it wasn't perfect coverage everywhere. And we let that just grow for a season. And now this year it's ready to graze, or I, mean, I should say 
the year after it was ready to graze because this was a few years ago now. So when you're establishing that forage, if you put that effort in, especially if you're buying the seed and establishing it, you often have to back off of, maybe you could hit it you know, once very quickly, but you don't wanna overdo it because you're just gonna waste all that, all that good effort. So finally, I'll just touch really briefly on tree fodder. Um, again, there's a lot of resource at our website. If you go to silvapasturebook.com, uh, there's a whole tree fodder seminar we just did in December that has great speakers about tree fodder, um, part of a grant that we had through SARE. But I'll just mention what we've learned over the time is um, in addition to establishing forage on the ground, trees have an incredible propensity to provide really good nutritious fodder for our livestock. Not just any time, but especially when it's um, absent in the pasture. So essentially dry seasons and droughts. Um, and so our farm studied these six uh, species for two years. We took nutrition samples. We have the whole report up on the website about all the breakdown. The take home is they all are nutritious. They all have different levels of nutrition. Um, and they all have kind of an interesting story. So like the European buckthorn in particular is one that I've noticed the sheep really take to. The leaves hold really long into the fall. The protein content stays very nice um, up in the high, high teens to low twenties throughout the season. And it's very easy to manage um, in a system where we can perpetuate it uh, long-term, not just sort of randomly browse it here and there. So we chose three species, the willow poplar and the locust. These are ones we've planted on the farm extensively. The three on the bottom are ones that we sort of find uh, naturalized on the farm, right? So learned a lot from that grant. Here's an example of a, this is a buckthorn pollard, all right? So we pollarded this buckthorn, which means we cut it off above browse height. This is one seasons of growth. That's a quite a bit of vegetative material for just one season of growth. And I walk by these and I see them and we don't tend to harvest these on the wet years like last year, but when we have a next dry year, I know we're gonna have a nice stash of forage. And that's really the beauty of a potential woodland silvopasture is if we continue to get that forage more and more established each season, and then we have another layer of tree fodder, we have a really resilient system that especially in dry and drought years is going to provide a really reliable food source because they found that your cool season grasses, even your warm season grasses, if it's a drought, tend to perform uh, especially well in drought conditions um, underneath that canopy of a forest because you're getting a little bit of a cooling microclimate underneath. So with that, I am done for that piece. I'm happy to try to take some questions. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, I'm going to give Steve just a, a, a momentary break to catch his breath, take a drink. Um, there are a bunch of questions that came in in the Q&A. If you have a question that you like directed to Steve, I would encourage you to put it there rather than in the chat. And there were other some, there's a lot of awesome discussion going on in the chat that maybe everything um, got settled there. But if you want something, you want Steve, Steve to definitely see it, um, please put it into that Q&A bubble. Um, so while Steve is kind of taking a look through those, I'm going to do one last poll, give everyone a, um, a chance to tell us, this one's, this is just as about, about as uh, quick as the first one, but just give us some feedback on, um, the session so far today. So I'll leave that open for folks to answer. So, <sighs> Steve, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to, if you'd like me to, um, read a couple, or if you want to start by um, taking any in particular. Well, yeah, I'll just, there's, there's a number of questions on the tree fodder. And so I, I, I'm going to, um, I'm going to not dig too deep into that because we did another webinar on it. And like I say, we have a whole bunch of resources on the website, but what I'll say in general, because I see some of the general questions that are really common. Yes, cows eat it. Yes, goats eat it. Yes, sheep eat it. But it depends on the species, um, uh, the breed, and also the sort of community culture of these animals. So we, if th there's been plenty of research to show that animals who aren't familiar with a tree fodder, doesn't matter if the book says they'll read it, they didn't read the book and so they, they may not eat it. So sometimes they have to be trained to eat those things. Um, there's always concerns about toxicity. I see someone mention about wilted cherry. Um, black locust always comes up, that sort of thing. The answer with the, the sort of simple answer with toxicity is, when animals are, um, when they're in a confinement situation, they're getting rationed feed, toxicity tends to occur because they're not familiar with how to self-regulate the intake of certain things. Our sheep eat tons of cherry, they eat tons of black locust, but they know how to self-regulate and so they're not going to typically overdo it. 
Um, so you don't want to introduce animals unfamiliar with sort of a free ranging diet to tree fodders like overnight. You want to introduce them slowly and, and work on that. Um, there are certain circumstances where you could say something is, is toxic, but it's a very specific set of circumstances. And that's the main one is the sort of animal behavior. And I, I definitely address that more in the tree fodder webinar. So, so proceed with caution, but know that um, the animals are curious and, and they might just need to, to have a, a couple, couple lessons to, to get started. <laughs> There are also a couple of folks wondering about your um, winter water, how you manage that with your sheep in the woods. So, well, we always on our farm have a strategy for manually moving water because we never know when something's going to break. <clears throat> um, I've had a lot of frozen pipes in my life, unfortunately, but um, so, you know, our positioning of our winter paddock and the ability to plow it and be able to drive a tractor up there is always the backup, but we do have, um, well, it's sort of in the process. We don't have it to the winter paddocks, but a lot of our woodland paddock, we, when we did that um, cabin construction I mentioned, we dug a well at the top of the land and we, we buried a water line all the way down. So now through all the woodland paddocks we have, we're going to have frost-free, you know, hydrant access. And I think that out of all the things we've spent money on, septic tanks and driveways and barns and buildings, a water line is the most cost-effective thing to get in. So, um, and I'd really recommend like you can do it in many places with like a ditch witch or something very low impact. Um, but again, think about those things. It's nice to combine that with a disturbance of a, maybe a silver pasture, but um, that's how we will long-term get them water. But right now we're just bringing it up in the tractor every day. Gets me out of bed in the morning. <laughs> um, a couple of folks wondering, I, I'm gonna kind of combine a couple of questions just about um, how, if you're looking for a consultant or someone to help you um, either design or it looks like people are looking for um, identifying vegetation, how do you go about doing that? So for like vegetation ID, um, depending on where you are, I would connect with your local extension office um, or ag service, whatever entity. If you're in the Midwest, like you have the Savannah Institute, which is amazing for agroforestry type stuff. Um, and I'd also connect with, um, Sometimes your state extension administers this, or sometimes there's like a private woodland owners group in your state or local area. Just find people basically that like to get together and walk around the woods and talk about the woods, because that's how you're going to learn ID. And, and especially about the patterning and sort of all the components of a forest um, is really by spending time around people that can do that. If there's a forester in your area, um, sometimes they do walks and talks, sometimes there's nature preserves, you know, any, any opportunity to walk with someone who has that familiarity can be really beneficial. Um, and the other thing I'd recommend with just ID is, is really to, to take it slow. Like you can be walking out and like in the, this part of the world we live in, you can walk in the woods and there's like 20 different tree species, but um, just start by identifying a couple and really learn not only like uh, the leaf pattern, which is not always useful because it's, it's up there, <laughs> but the bark patterns, the growth patterns, what it looks like when it's young versus middle-aged versus older. There's a really wonderful ID book called Bark, B-A-R-K, um, which is a tree ID guide based on identifying trees utilizing their bark, which I think is a really helpful starting point for folks. Wonderful. Um, let's see, scrolling down. Quick, oh, here's an easy one. Um, oh, someone answered that. Someone was wondering about the name of the video season or series you were talking about, Woodlanders. Yeah. Okay, got that. Yeah, good one. Um, gosh, let's see. Did anything else strike your? Um, There's a couple about burning to clear the the floor. Um, uh -huh. Do you like to address that at all? Yeah, I would say um, burning, we've definitely burned some piles of stuff. I think that um, I mentioned the the slash or all the material has a benefit to soil health long-term if you can just let it lie somewhere, but that isn't always possible. Um, you know, so if you, you know, we pile it off in the corner and it's not in our way of the fencing or the animals, then it's fine and it's just going to break down. That's, that's ideal. Um, there's a lot of strate strategy in like, literally the way you just orchestrate yourself. It's very easy to go in the woods. You have a chainsaw and you just want to drop a bunch of trees and then you're like, oh, got to go. And then you leave all this stuff behind and then no one wants to go back and clean that up. So I really recommend just as a strategy that you like cut something and then pile it or process it or otherwise just sort of clear it. So you're not creating this 
obscene pile of stuff that you don't want to deal with. Um, I see other questions related to this, like, do I use the chip or shredder? I definitely do not <laughs> because um, for the amount of time I spent shoving branches in and you get this cute little pile of wood chips, I don't feel like it's useful uh, at scale to do unless you get a really industrial one, which I've never really had access to. Um, but you could rent a really big one if you really wanted to make uh, that material. That's why the forestry mulcher is nice because you're clearing and essentially mulching in, in place, which I think is really ideal. Um, and uh, Mark was asking, just to say a little more about the forestry mulcher. So we were able to rent it locally from an equipment uh, rental place. You know, it was about uh, $200 a day. I think it was a five day rental for about a thousand, maybe a little less. Um, and we we cleared, I think close to eight acres. I mean, it was, a, it was a lot of work and felt very useful. And compared to all the little trimming, slow <laughs> conversion, it was nice to have, uh, some area just just cleared really quickly, um, and so and so that worked really well for us. Um, I think if you you know contract that work out, um, you're going to be paying somewhere in the range of sixty to one hundred dollars an hour usually. And you just want to make sure that contractor again is aware of the things you don't want them to chew up because they're used to clearing land like usually one hundred percent. So if you're asking them to you know leave little islands and trees, you might need to be, be sure that's really clear. Um, yeah, but overall, I think it's it's a good strategy if if you if you can maneuver around things that you you don't want to cut and um, and also if the land isn't so wet. So some of the areas on our land are too wet to to have that kind of machinery. We wouldn't do it there, but for the chunk we wanted to do, it worked really well. Awesome. Um, okay, one question. We'll just take a couple more. I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but there is some a question that um, gotten up voted a couple by several people wondering about how. Um, poultry could fit into this system. And they say, um, we do goat grazing poultry rotation currently. I want to work on opening up a planted white pine plot. I can see poultry disturbing things too much, perhaps, but I'm also thinking about additional manure. Um, and she goes on. Any yeah, thoughts I mean, on that? Yeah, we've had, we've had, uh, we've had chickens and ducks both on the farm. And um, I think they do great. They do great job. They, they're so good at fertility cycling, which is really helpful for, for trees and um, whether like we do a lot of them in our orchards and they're really beneficial for keeping the orchard clipped as well as, as fertilizing. Um, and and the, the key thing is just not leaving them in one place for, for too long. So chickens want fresh ground like every day, really like the best chicken systems I've seen They're they're small houses that are often moved at least once a day to fresh ground. So what happens when you get too much disturbance is they're like, well, there's no bugs in this layer. So I'm going to dig deeper and I'm going to dig deeper. And I would be concerned about that, especially in like a shallow rooted, you know, pine plantation, if you just fenced in, you know, the whole thing and just let them go at it or had too many birds or didn't move them. But I think in slow bursts, it can be, it can be uh, beneficial or at least neutral. <laughs> Right. Um, I'm just scrolling down to see what's been upvoted. Um, someone's asked, wondering about other breeds of sheep that could pot potentially thrive in the system, especially the winter pens when there's not a traditional barn. Yeah, I mean, I'd love for people to chime in on the chat because um, that's uh, that depends a lot. <laughs> um, I let's see. Um, I had friends work with uh, Jacobs and Icelandics and have good success in these types of systems. Um, um, St. Croix is a really rare breed that, that our neighbors have had that, that have been fine. Um, it's really like the dairy breeds that seem to have a hard time with the woody, woody stuff. Um, but I think it's also because they're just like fed really nice treats on the stand usually. Um, so, and again, I think a lot of it is training as much in behavior, as much as the breed. So if you're, you know, when you're, it was really important for us when we purchased our animals, we narrowed down a small list of breeds, but then we also you know, visited a bunch of farms and saw where they were grazing and what they were doing. So if you want to take a lot of time training them, then, you know, you don't care where they come from. But if you want some animal that's going to work in a similar uh, system that you have, you want to make sure they're in that system. And that um, someone mentioned in the questions, Fred Prevenza's work, which I really recommend and he he's done some webinars on here, but just the concept of of learning that happens within a, within a livestock community is amazing. Um, and you can't overestimate that. So you get this learning and this familiarity with even tastes the taste of buckthorn passed down through the mother's milk through generations. And um, 
you might be able to train anything to eat that, but if, if it's already embedded, I think that there's a lot of value in that. So, so if you're going to buy a breed, be like, do your animals graze in the woods? Like, what does that look like? Can I see? And just kind of get a sense of that. That's actually how we found Katahdin's. It wasn't even, we knew they were really good at, good at Woody Browse. It was just the neighbor we bought them from. She had them kind of out in the woods and they were doing their thing. And we said, great, that's, that's what we have too. So. Sounds good. All right. Well, let me think, let me take this one. And if you want to maybe find one other one, um, Steve, but, uh, Ben's wondering, how do you figure out if it's worthwhile investing in soil amendments and or seeding? Well, so, um, so your pH is really important um, in soil testing. Um, and if it, it, ideally it's slightly acidic, but if it's really, um, um, if it's lower than five or it's higher than, I can't, I can't remember what they usually recommend, seven and a half or something. It's like, doesn't want to be too alkaline. That's a much lower range. But um, if it's if it's outside of the bounds and you can find that in a forage uh, reference, then you have a concern for the forages itself. There's a there's that target range that's sort of like around neutral, but slightly acidic. Um, and then nutrient wise, um, you're, you're probably already deficient in phosphorus, FYI, because most pastures mm -hmm. uh, in temperate climates are. Um, because we've done a really good job mining it out of the soil. But um, there's not a lot of other stuff that's like uh, critical. What's more useful in the livestock diet usually is to say, okay, if it's not in the soil and it's not in the plants, I need to supplement with a good nutritional supplement. Um, but as far as the forages go, there's nothing that's majorly a problem. Usually if you use those kind of wide ranging cool season grasses as the basis, as far as trees go, they, they don't care that much, honestly. You don't have to worry too much unless something's really out of whack. So if you're planting trees, you know, you can get away with a much wider range. Um, but I would I would just encourage you to consult, again, your local university or extension grazing resources for kind of the soil parameters that are good because each area is really specific. Like we're very selenium deficient here, for instance. And so that's a cause for concern. But any local extension or um, or like your, your veterinarian is gonna know what, what things to really look out for in your soil test. Well, I, <laughs> I see more questions have come in since um, I know that we're not going to get to everything today, Steve. So maybe um, um, there is one that maybe has been asked a couple times. Um, can you speak a little bit more about pollarding and coppicing? Yeah, that's a great um, that's a great one to end on. <laughs> and I'll say I'm glad I I'm glad I got people excited or curious about it because it's a very exciting, curious thing and. Our friend Mark Kravchek, who's on the call, is coming out with a book on coppicing in June. And so um, he probably will put the link to the website um, in the chat. But um, there's a whole world of, of things to uncover and understand. And it's a really nice companion to, to the silver pasture stuff we're talking about. So um, I'm excited to have that as a resource. And our Cornell program is going to have Mark speak on coppice in, in June as well. So um, you can keep a lookout for that. Our, our agroforestry page is cornellagroforestry.org. So if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing in the Cornell system with agroforestry, you can check it out there and stay tuned for those. Uh, awesome. Those That's great to know. Yeah, I'll definitely pass that information along to folks. Cool. Um, awesome. Let me just share this final screen. All right, everyone. Well, thank you. Um, before we sign off, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, I will be sending out a recording of this webinar uh, on the slides, probably first thing in the morning. So keep an eye out for my email and I'll be sure to include links to all of uh, Steve's past webinars with us as well. Uh, we have some other great sessions coming up, but we'll be scheduling a, a few more into March and April. Um, so keep an eye out for those. I'll send out links in, our, um, in my email. Uh, so that you can register if you're interested. Um, but I'd like to really thank you, Steve, for being back with us um, again today and last week. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on and your your talks are are really, really helpful. And um, thanks for taking the time to, you know, to answer questions from our audience. Um, thank you to Samantha, my gracious fact colleague for helping behind the scenes uh, and then to everyone else in the audience that's that's with us right now it's uh, really great to have you on our sessions and to see folks chiming in and engaging and helping answer everyone you know other questions and and the interest is is wonderful to see so hopefully you'll be able to join us for another session 
in the future. Um, I hope everyone has a great beginning of their week, rest of your week, and that we're able to uh, connect again soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.